Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Peter James, uh, ACS, ASC, and uh, I started at, at Supreme Sound in the early days, and uh, um, I didn't really know anything about cinematography when I started. My cousin was uh, John Cleary, an author. He wrote about 50 novels, and he had a relationship with Merv Murphy, who ran the studio at, at, Supreme, <coughs> at Supreme Sound, and um, um, he thought that I'd be... Yeah, might be good at that. So I got a summer job there. Um, basically, I was I'm dyslexic, and trying to get uh, through high school was a nightmare. Uh, not being able to read, um, I never finished a paper. <laughs> I was just ran out of time, and uh, they didn't know, they hadn't invented dyslexia in those days. So, uh, but when I went to the studio, I, I just found it was the the perfect job for me. I, I just loved it from day one, and. Uh, they let me stay on. I stayed there for three or four years, I think, or for no more, five years, I think. And then I went on to uh, do focus pulling for Carl Kaiser and Ross Nichols on uh, on um, uh, Riptide at, wow. at our Transa, and that was uh, that was a big learning curve working on a BNC rack over camera um, with, a, with the viewfinder flopping around on the outside and you know the big old BNC lenses and. Um, uh, that was like real, the real theatre, theatrical stuff, which I wasn't sure whether I was going to like doing theatricals because I was really into um, TV commercials at, at that stage. But I found that I really did like doing drama. And um, I went on, went freelance then. I think David Gribble went freelance about the same time. He'd been on Skippy. And we were like the, some of the first two freelancers out there as camera assistants. And then... I ended up doing some documentary work. I wanted, to, I wanted to learn about camera operating and finding the editing points in the camera, uh, which is a very hard thing to explain to somebody, how to find the cutting points. But uh, documentary guys and news guys all know how to do that sort of thing, whereas people in drama don't. I did some short films. Uh, did a great short film with uh, uh, Don Crombie, the director. And... Um, that was um, uh, Who Killed Jenny Langby, which was a, a docudrama, which was my, fa it still is one of my favourite mediums. I've, I'd love to do one now, um, where it's shot like a documentary. It's about a family, what happens when this woman commits suicide, and, and they interview her before she dies, and then they go back and interview the family after she died. So the first bit was done in black and white film, and then... The, her her acts her her suicide where she jumps leaves the baby on the on the train platform and jumps in front of the uh, the train that was shot by my camera assistant who was a stringer with the ABC he had a he had a wind up bollocks so I gave him a hundred feet of black and white and said away you go you shoot it the way you would want to shoot it so he jumped down on the tracks and you know did all that sort of stuff and uh, they cut all that in and then. We come back with Ann, Ann Deverson to do the interview with the family after the, the and interview the social workers and interview the family, and we did that in colour. Well, I think people thought it was real footage because it looked completely differently. The photography was completely differently, and that's when I realised this is great fun. Like lighting, the the black and white stuff was done really raw and really just one light bulb and hard shadows and real nitty gritty sort of stuff, and then. The magazine stuff was done with the interviewer was more professional. Like they brought a soft light in and they they lit it up a bit, and it was a little bit more, you know, a um, little bit more control in the photography. But um, I thought it was a really that sort of sparked my interest in thinking. Well, in one film, you don't have to have the same look. You can change the look, and I've done that in several films now, where the where all the look progresses. From, from one end of the start of the film to the very end of the film. Miss Daisy is a good example of that. Um, uh, the man who sued, uh, the, the, the um, Mao's Last Dancer, where I, for the Chinese footage, I only used half the frame of, of shot on film. We only used 50% of the negative. And then when we go to America, we use the full 185 um, frame. 
So I wanted to get a very different look. And then in the DI, of course, you can do a lot more adjustments as well. But to get the grain and the texture of the, of the early China. Um, so, and those things can marry together very well in a film. Um, Jeffrey Unsworth was my hero at the time. And uh, I'd watched him work on Don Quixote. I went down to do a documentary for Channel 7 of Don Quixote and uh, of the filming and then I stayed on and uh, just to watch um, Jeffrey lighting. I'd climb up into the gantry and lie on a plank and look at him for hours walking around the stage and looking what Tony Tegg the gaffer was doing and how the camera was being moved on this big heavy McAllister dolly with a, I think it was a, I forget what the camera was, I think it was, it was a, a BNC. BNC with a big zoom on the front of it. But uh, watching him light was, uh, was life changing. Uh, for me, um, and I saw that you could do things. The thing was to have the the dream, have the imagination, to have the big picture. Jeffrey did a thing where um, a cart is comes onto the stage, and um, uh, the actor jumps off the back. I think it might have been Nureyev, and um, there's big windmills in the, uh, as a setting, and it's a big, big stage, and. Uh, he wanted the moonlight to be three-quarter backlight and he got two brood arcs up there and one shot on to one side of the stage and the other shot onto the other side of the stage and he asked um, Tony Tegg to cut them so that there was only one shadow when the dancer does his whole dance across the stage. Well, we all know that's impossible to get two lights next to one another, get a cut so that there's always going to be a changeover between the two lights. And either you make it go black in the middle, therefore they go from one, one light to the other light, or you blend it so that they... But they played around with for about an hour to try and... with great big cutters hanging out, you know, you know 12 feet from the arcs to try and get the, sh the cut as sharp and as clean as possible to make this uh, work. Well, there's a point there where they always do get a double shadow, um, but the idea was the best idea, and... The fact that you can't always execute the idea as, as perfectly as you would like it to be done, the fact that he had that great idea to have that single light source way up back in the corner of the stage, um, it made the look of the made the look of the um, uh, the picture. So I thought, well, don't compromise and muck around with, you know, a different. Stick to your ideas, and and somehow or other it will work. You'll you'll pull it off. The technical side of filmmaking has changed completely. Uh, when I first started, it was hard light, black and white. And uh, it was a, you know, a 5K key, uh, a 2K fill through some spun glass, um, and that was about it. There were shadows everywhere. Um, it was a slow, you know, 16 ASA ectochrome, uh, very, or the black and white. You might be lucky to get 100 ASA black and white. Um, none of the none of the fast um, films like or, or uh, cameras like we have today, so you really had to light everything up. And unless you lit it, there was nothing hap nothing was happening. Um, uh, advances in in faster lenses, uh, faster film stocks, all these things made you know super speed lenses was a huge revolution in in the business and and fine grain. 500 mil film uh, was also another huge revolution into, into getting a more naturalistic look. Um, when you see films like Crash that were done digitally and with very little lighting, some lighting, but not, not having to light a whole city for night, um, that everybody thought, wow, this is great. Digitally, you can do this sort of stuff now. Um, but the problem I find with the digital thing is that people get an image they uh, they plug the camera in you get an image and we said wow let's let's start shooting it's great we're lit you know we've got an image well you got an image but it's not lit and um, telling a story uh, with lighting is um, is really our main that's the main job of a director of photography like um, if, uh, cinematographers may go out and just capture documentary style available light uh, and do really good work and have a drone and do all sorts of smart camera moves and a bit of steady cam stuff and so on. But lighting 
is still the main thing that tells the story. It's one of the it's the, one of the emotional things and the mood things that is required in filmmaking. Um, and really, that's our, that's our job is to be good to be good at lighting as well, and um, uh, as well as all the camera operational stuff. And um, uh, you know, black and white films like Schindler's List, it's basically just flicking a switch into black and white, really. That, I thought, was poorly poor example of black and white. If you want to see black and white, go back to the old films, the Ruben Mamoulian and so on, and look at the, how they really used the shadows. They weren't frightened of shadows. They, they made them absolutely dramatic, and the film noir films were just spectacularly brave. Um, but to try and do that today, they'd, they'd shoot you. Um, and it often... Now, if they'd shoot something in black and white, they just flick a switch in the camera and say it's black and white or in post. Um, but there's not another detail of checkerboarding or having contrast and using shadows to create moods, um, telling stories, you know. But you, and a lot of this can, you can be done in post, like controlling the, the ratio can be done in post. Um, con controlling the colour can be done in post. Um, not like the old days where it all had to be really done in the camera. So there's a lot of great tools at the back end to, to tell the story, but you've got to get something there to start with, which you can work with, that is going to work in the end for you, for what it, whether it's day for night or whether it's um, uh, you know, high-key musical or a science fiction film. Um, it's nice to build some of those, as much as you can, into the picture before you... So you get a, a good idea, then, and then, you've got, then you can build on it very easily. Well, cinematography is an art and a science. So the technical side is really important and there's, you know, people working on, you know, brilliant people working on developing new things all the time. Um, and that's the only thing we can be sure of is going to change, is that it's going to, it's going to, things are going to get bigger and better. Storage is going to, Moore's Law, you know, storage is going to get bigger and better. Uh, cameras will get lighter and smaller and all that sort of stuff. And um, uh, the resolution will go up. Um, so these things are a given. This is always going to happen. And uh, half the time people are sitting around on, on camera cases reading manuals, which is, you know, it's, it, the change is very rapid. Um, but the artistic side is the other side of it. Um, and it's, dare I say, it's more important than the, than the, uh, the physical side of it. Um, like, you're getting a lot of people who are engineers but they, they, they can't light, could not light their way out of a paper bag. You know, they're just absolutely hopeless as far as artistic things go. They don't know what a good composition is. Um, the, the camera placement's wrong. Um, you know, it, it, it's a mess. And I think you've got... To be a good cinematographer, you really have to have both. You've got to have the art and the science in a balance. But I think you have to have more artistic side of it. And... The higher up the chain you get, you can get people underneath you to do all the all the technical stuff and to you know to work all that stuff out, which is which is great. But to have the big idea, you know, and to have that dream, that vision for the how the film's going to look, that's so important. You know, that's that's the job of the DP, the cinematographer, to have that big idea and that's probably the biggest thing well I've, I've seen the ACS go from the very early days because all the guys I worked with were the founding fathers of the ACS and they, they were the guys who taught me and uh, very generous men they were you know they they were all very keen on this um, organization and it was basically just a small little nucleus of guys in Sydney but we've seen it grow from go to different states and now the states have their own awards and the federal uh, group uh, is, does, does a huge amount of work with magazines and educational things and bringing people out to Australia and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's really interesting and it's a great chance for um, to learn things. Like I know we can get a lot of stuff off the internet and everybody says, oh, no, I don't need to, you know, to go to the ACS. I just, go, just look at the internet and I can get everything. Well, you can. You can get fantastic stuff off the internet. But when you're at an ACS meeting, 
uh, this happened to me in Tasmania. I had a, a night there, and that was one of the best nights I've ever had in an ACS uh, event. Now that's yeah, you know, and you think in Tasmania that was the best. That was the best event. It's better than the ASC ever, could ever be. Um, it was loose. There's only a few people there. The questions were outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And the guys apologised for not having many, many members there. I said, well, it's a shame there aren't more members here because look what a great night it's been. It was, so, it was serendipity, you know. Things come up, one question leads to another, and now you don't get on the internet. You don't get that off the internet. You might get it in a chat room or something like that, you know, um, whatever that crazy um, you know, uh, link is for uh, CML. CML, which is, you know, all boffins typing away and so on. But this, it, which is great, you know, they've got a, a good thing going. Uh, but this was just a wonderful night. And, and of course, uh, there's the, the camaraderie and people sharing stories and, you pick up ideas, and it's great to see so many young people at the meetings that I go to um, really participating and really having you know input into into the evenings. So it's I think it's got a great future. Mm -hmm.